everybody. I'm Howard David in Ms. Lou Control in New York. You've seen it time and time again. The forward pass, the dramatic, super-skilled completion, or the game-winning touchdown. Always emphasizing that the pass has become the most visible, most exciting play in football. And now we'll bring you the whole story of the pass from its birth more than 75 years ago. And with me to tell the story is your co-host, John Unitas, who knows as much about the pass as anyone, who in his legendary career with the old Baltimore Colts was a genius at picking defenses to pieces, doing it for 18 years, 40,000 yards, all-pro status, Hall of Famer, three times the National Football League's most valuable player. We welcome you, John, and I'm sure you'll agree that the forward pass is certainly the most exciting play for your concern in football, <laughs> and uh, in some cases it even uh, has a weird history attached to it. Thanks, Howard, for all those nice things you said about me. And yes, the pass has been a big part of my life. And yes, the coaches and quarterbacks live by it and sometimes die by it. Now, let's go way back because the past started in the early days of the century, 1906 to be exact. Football's early days, primitive by today's standards, had captured public interest, even though a Cornell president said he wouldn't allow a group of students to travel 400 miles for a game to, quote, agitate a bag of wind. The bags of wind were soon agitated across the nation, but the game was all muscle and mass momentum. The flying wedge led to horrible injuries and many deaths. And so when President Teddy Roosevelt ordered the colleges to open up the game or he'd abolish it, the forward pass was born in 1906. There were some strange limitations in those days. A pass had to be thrown at least five yards to right or left of the center. And so lengthwise stripes were added to the horizontal stripes, making the field look like a checkerboard or gridiron, giving a new name to the field. Meanwhile, an incomplete pass could be recovered by the defense if touched by the offense, John. And a pass caught over the goal line was a touchback for the defense and not a TD. And an incomplete pass over the goal line was also a touchback. Passes were limited to not more than 20 yards, and for many years, not more than one pass could be thrown in one series of downs. And there was no such thing as pass interference. Defenders were allowed to belt or maul a receiver at will before the ball got there or while he was trying to catch it. Well, the rules makers took pity on the receivers and soon put in an interference rule, and the pass began to make progress. By the way, here's what early footballs looked like. Before the turn of the century, they were roundish, almost like soccer balls. Then an early oval one, mostly lobbed end over end. Then they narrowed it a bit, and passers learned to throw a spiral for more speed and accuracy. Then Amos Alonzo Stagg of Chicago pioneered firing the ball to a man running to a certain spot at full speed instead of just camping under it. Howard is beginning to sound like modern football, especially when they dropped that silly rule limiting a pass to 20 yards and began making heroes out of guys with strong arms. But coaches in the East sneered at the pass as sissy stuff and too erratic. But in 1913, two kids at Notre Dame, quarterback Gus Doré and an end named Newt Rockney, practiced the pass all summer on a Lake Erie beach. Doré throwing and Rockney catching. Mighty Army had scheduled Little Notre Dame as a breather that year. Well, Easterners had never seen pass routes like that as Doré completed 17, mostly to an elusive Rockney for a 35-13 upset of the year. And soon the pass became a common weapon. And John, among the passing combinations that followed, the first nationally acclaimed duo showed up at Michigan in 1925-26, where fielding Hurry Up Yost had an All-America twosome in quarterback Benny Friedman and end of Benny Oosterbahn. Friedman adept at hitting receivers right on the money, and Oosterbahn talented, a whiz on pass routes. By now, the pass was so popular with fans, coaches were coming up with stunts with it. Incidentally, Howard, do you know who devised the first screen pass? No, but I'm sure you looked it up, so come on, lay it on me. Nope, I knew it all the time. Bob Zupke of Illinois, along about 1920. He also designed the flea flicker, which grew into many versions, the basic one being a quick toss behind the line to reversing back, who stops and pitches it back to the first back, who fires it downfield to an end. And in 1934, they came up with the truly modern, slimmer, pointier ball, enabling the passer to grip it better and even toss an even tighter spiral. And the floodgates really opened for the pass. Look at this, even crazier flea flicker designed by Francis Schmidt at Ohio State. Howard, then from the Southwest came the first modern folk hero of the past. And I hate to admit it, but he wasn't even a quarterback. 
Sammy Bob, Texas Christian, was a gangling six foot three triple threat tailback, the first guy of whom it was said he's got a rifle for an arm. John Ball was a good runner and superb putter and completed nearly 300 passes for his three years at TCU. Later, Sammy went on to start him with the Washington Redskins. But let's hear about Ball's early years from Sammy himself. TCU, they stressed the passing game. Now, the, at that time, they were really the only team I thought uh, in football that really stressed the passing game a lot. I know that uh, we were given permission to throw any time that uh, we wanted to. And uh, Dutch Ma always uh, would tell me, he said, you think along with the defense. You think what the defense is thinking you're going to do on this situation, you do the opposite. That's the way I was taught. And we gambled a lot, I guess, people would say at that time. But we played a fairly wide open game, and I thought an interesting game. And we came nearer to playing uh, like the pros do at this time than uh, we did uh, when I first went up into the pros. I think we had uh, a more imagination in the passing game at TCU than we did when I first went to Washington. A lot has been made of the shotgun formation in the pros. Sam, how similar is the shotgun formation to the single wing that you used in the 30s? Well, we not only use the single wing, we use what they call a shotgun. We had one back sitting up in front of the, of the uh, tailback back there. We would get back about seven yards, and uh, we'd either we'd kick, quick kick, we'd run, or we'd pass from it. And uh, we used it when I was in uh, Washington there. We used that formation quite a bit. And the uh, we, only thing we called it was double wing spread. Then everybody stopped using it for a while, and then San Francisco came back with it, and they called it shotgun formation. It's been that ever since. But we've used it in college. We used it in pro before they named it shotgun even. So uh, there's nothing much different in football than uh, now than it ever has been. There were other great passers in the late 1920s and 1930s who contributed much to the expanding aerial game. It was Bobby Dodd of Tennessee, Cliff Montgomery of Columbia, Sid Luckman, another Columbian, and of course the quarterback who in 1940 first harnessed the pass to the brand new T formation, adding a new dimension to the game. The old lefty himself, Stanford's Frankie Albert, guided by coach Clark Shaughnessy, designer of the modern T. Meanwhile, Howard, the young NFL decided the best way to compete with the colleges was to go them one better with the pass. And the first great pro aerial duel came from the Green Bay Packers. The Packers trotted out quarterback Arnie Herber and the legendary end, Don Hudson of Alabama. Working from the single wing, Herber to Hudson in the late 1930s made the pass the best weapon yet seen. Before retiring, Hudson became the greatest receiver in pro history with a record 99 touchdown catches. By the 1950s, the pass was producing football's sharpest weapon. Fans wanted the lightning in the sky, the dramatic strikes for game winners. Passing yardage exceeded running in almost every pro game. 200 yards a game by one team was just an average ho-hum day. Three touchdown passes per game were common. Now came the new glamour guys of football. Start first with Otto Graham after World War II with Paul Brown's Cleveland Browns. He zipped them short and long as the game took on new labels, fly patterns, post routes, flares, safety valves. He taught future quarterbacks how to use the clock with his two-minute warning game. Right, John? He sure did, but let's hear it from Otto himself as our field reporter Gary Landau visits in New London, Connecticut with Captain Otto Graham, a recently retired from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Thank you, Johnny. With me is one of the men you might have picked up a few pointers from along the way, former Cleveland Browns star quarterback Otto Graham. How do you find the passing game in the NFL today compares with the passing game when you were in the NFL? I would say, frankly, that uh, today the passing game is better than back in my day. There's no doubt in my mind about it that the players are better players. The quarterbacks are better passers, the receivers are faster, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, nowadays, of course, they have what they call the nickel defense, for example. And back in my day, they had some zone and man for man. So you could throw the ball and lob the ball more, and throw a softer pass, which was easier to catch. But nowadays, because there are so many people in the back there in the defense, that the passers have to throw the ball that much harder. And so therefore, the receivers have to be able to catch the ball that much better, have much, much stronger hand. And it makes it very, very tough. And uh, 
the rules today, of course, uh, also, I think, are, are a big factor in this type of thing. Uh, uh, it has helped the receivers immensely. And uh, the shotgun, for example, I couldn't understand why it took so many teams a long time to use a shotgun. The Dallas Cowboys have used it for years. I used a shotgun back in 1963 when the Coast Guard Academy had its only undefeated, untied season. We went to the shotgun uh, because we had injured our quarterback. We had a back into both run and pass, and we killed the team that should have beaten us. And any quarterback will tell you to rather throw from being further back the shotgun. So whenever you have a, a sure pass situation, to have a play action pass is ridiculous because everybody in the stands knows you're going to throw the ball. Why waste that time let the quarterback get back and have a better chance to look downfield and find his receiver and have the receivers a better chance to get open? Other greats now retired left stats proving their wizardry. Len Dawson of Kansas City, the longest pro career with 19 years and almost 29,000 yards passing. Bart Starr of the Packers hung in for 16 years and almost 25,000 yards. And let's not forget this one, called Roger the Dodger. Last name, Staubach. Navy's Heisman winner spent five years in service before joining the Cowboys. But his 11 seasons produced glittering stardom and much magic of last-minute heroics. Too often, they had to track him down and failed as slippery Roger made it look easy. His field of fire was nearly always on somebody's numbers of fingertips. No telling how many more than his 28,000 yards he'd have if not for his Navy service. But the NFL's all-time slippery character, still on the most wanted list posted by frustrated defenders, was Fran Tarkington, who made a living running for his life before putting the ball into Viking and Giants hands. Fran ran up the biggest numbers of all, with 3,687 completions and a staggering 47,000 yards, which is about 25 miles. But we have to add one more super slinger to our list, that brash, confident kid from Alabama named Joe Willie Namath, who began throwing for 300-plus yards per game and predicted his upstart Jets would whip the favored Colts in the Super Bowl, and did just that. Our passing and records go hand in hand. How about Norm Van Brocken's record of 554 yards for the Rams against the Giants in 1951? The Chargers, Dan Fouts, 4,715 yards for a season in 1980. George Blanda of the Oilers tossing 68 passes in one game against the Bills in 1964. 42 completions by the Jets' Richard Todd against the 49ers in 1980. Most TDs in a game, a mark that may last forever. Eight shared by Sid Luckman of the Bears, Adrian Burke of the Eagles, George Blanda of the Oilers, Y.A. Tittle of the Giants, Joe Cap of the Vikings. But what about the other end of the pass, John? When the ball's thrown, it has to be caught by some of the most talented athletes in football. And that talent means speed, great hands, timing, super concentration, running perfect routes, just simple things like that. And don't forget toughness, not being afraid to get hit in midair. Don made it to the Jets, kept his skills for 15 years, longest of any receiver, grabbing a record 633 for almost 12,000 yards in the clear and in traffic. And Raymond Berry of the Colts helped make John Unitas famous, even with one leg a smidgen shorter than the other, with speed less than impressive, but with moves that could lose the defender in a phone booth. In 13 years, 631 catches, 68 touchdown receptions. Fred Bolitnikoff of the Raiders, another receiver who only maybe could beat his grandmother in a foot race, but who had the hands of a magician. The union of NFL defensive backs wanted to toss him a party when he hung up his cleats. But in a much swifter mold was Paul Warfield of the Browns, one of the fleetest of all receivers who still holds the NFL mark of an average of 20 yards per catch. And before his injury, Kevin Winslow of the Chargers, because of his speed, strength, and courage, was known as the ultimate tight end. John, I think it's time we pointed out that the pass is more than tossing the ball and catching it. Between those two is a lot of theory, a lot of planning, and even some doubt and frustration. Let's explore one of the best offensive minds in the game. And for that, we go to Joe Starkey in San Francisco, who's standing by with the head coach of the 49ers, Bill Walsh. And Bill, of course, you know there are so many uh, almost rumors about how you run an offense, the passing game that you have, and how incredibly innovative it is. How many different passing plays do you have, really? Well, we don't count them by plays, but I would expect that in a given game plan, there are over 100. Now, these are things that have been practiced and rehearsed over weeks and actually years of time where a formation may vary from week to week and there are certain concepts that hold true on all all of them but to be honest with you there'd probably be a hundred in a given game plan 
I think a lot of fans, when they think about a team built around offense, assumes that you live and die by the bomb, you throw the long one for 40 or 50 yards, but that isn't really the Bill Walsh style of passing. Uh, the 49ers certainly do not operate that way. Obviously, the, uh, you like to get it, but it's not built around the long pass, is it? No, it's built around really success, consistency, a method of moving the ball with the same kind of consistency or more consistency than a running game. So we're looking for a high percentage of completions and a good yardage on our, com our completions, but to build from one pass play to another. And then when we see a chance to go deep, we go deep. Coach, looking at your overall offensive game plan, do you look for a particular type of lineman for your offensive plan? Well, not really. We're looking for activity. We're looking for the best uh, athletes available. Then we sort of mold our system around them. If we have Bubba Paris blocking well, we like to run behind him. But one thing we have to have are receivers that don't drop the ball. You have to be able to catch the ball in our system because we just can't afford wasted plays where we get a man open through the movement of a lot of other people only to have him drop it. And this year we've had a minimum amount of uh, pa drop passes. A couple of years ago we had virtually none. But that's a big part of it. Howard, we mentioned doubts and frustrations about the past. And in the interest of balancing our act, we should point out there have been highly successful coaches who didn't throw the ball around a lot. For the most famous in that regard, we go to Gary Radnich in Columbus, Ohio, standing by with Woody Hayes, the former Ohio State coaching great. Coach, pro football today predominantly relies on the passing game. Do you feel they're going overboard in, uh, in that direction? I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. As a matter of fact, yesterday would almost prove that because so many of them, their passing game didn't work. Why? Because that's all they had. Now, if they were running in there and forced those linebackers to play the run, then they'd have a good passing game with it. But they're going overboard on the passing. And yes, and it is uh, causing a lot of teams to get beat because that defense is getting tougher and tougher and smarter and smarter. Had I gone into the passing game, I'd have done the same thing they do now. Pass, 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 pass. Because the two games don't go too well together. Because in your running game, you've got to be firing out and making that defense move so you can find a hole to cut through. Mm -hmm. Action and reaction on the defense. Now then, in the passing game, you know, sir, that big line has got to drop back and pick up that rusher as he comes in. Well, I've always said you don't retreat to victory. And in our league, the great passing teams always end up in the second division. Thanks, Woody. You know, John, fans hear a lot about pass routes. Any mystery to it at all? Not at all, Howard. Let's take a look at just a few of the most common run by the receivers. This is a combination pattern by the two receivers. One, the outside going down and in, the inside going down and out. It's called a drag pattern. Otis Taylor here on what they just called a flanker over the middle. Very simply, simply done, and a fine reception and a tremendous hit right here. Did I hurt you, sweetheart? Great running and great balance by Otis Taylor, one of the best ones in the league. And again, Otis Taylor on a down and corner, what we would call a corner pattern with a tremendous catch. The ball being thrown outside because no one's going to receive it except him. Earlier, John, we talked about old-time receivers who got knocked silly even before they touched the ball. Today, interference rules are an absolute must, even though many calls are controversial. And so, with the benefit of actual game film, we'd like you to point out what is and what isn't pass interference. Howard, as one who lived and died with it, I'd be glad to. Uh, the ball was being overrun by the defensive man. The offensive man has a right, right to come back for the football. There was a bumping action right there, which you saw the the offensive man got in way of the offense, the defensive man rather got in way of the offensive man, and uh, stopped him from going after the football. Here you see a tripping call by the official right there, as the uh, defender tripped the offensive man coming in. Right here, could it this call could go either way, interference or not, but. I don't think his feet were in bounds, but the interference call was best a very difficult call for the official. Certainly, uh, the history of the forward pass would not be complete without discussing the forward pass and its value to John Unitas, coming out of Louisville and not being heavily thought of by the pro game, but yet you made a lot of uh, doubting Thomases uh, regret their words. Well, we had a lot of fun, Howard. We had a long career, but uh, 
I can't receive all the credit for myself. I think when, you, when you're when you successful, like we had been in Baltimore, that, that all that success goes to the people that you played with, you know. Certainly without a Raymond Berry or Lenny Moore or Jimmy Orr or John Mackey, uh, no one would ever have heard of Johnny Unitas. You mentioned all of the quote-unquote skilled position people. The offensive linemen, though, had a lot to do with keeping your sanity, not to mention your health. Well, I don't tend to overlook those people. I used to take them out to dinner at least once a week just to make sure that they were happy and satisfied and to keep those people off me. John, I know this half hour has gone by very quickly for you, talking about your favorite subject, and to all of the receivers and quarterbacks that helped make this an interesting program, we thank you very much for tuning in. For John Unitas, I'm Howard David saying thanks for watching the history of the forward pass. You have just seen the history of the forward pass. A phenomenon that continues.